next. All right, council business items. Anything in the way of business, folks? All right, not seeing any. Let's move on to presentations and the interviews for District 4 candidates. All right, good evening. As you all may have seen in the packet, we have one candidate. And uh, Jefferson Mildenberger is here with us this evening. So Jefferson, if you wouldn't mind heading up to the uh, hot seat, as it were. <clears throat> All right, sure, thank you. Uh, first, thank you, right? Thank you so much for your willingness to serve. Um, we greatly appreciate it as that's how we do what we do. So thank you so much. Um, so I think I'll just launch in folks and then we can ask questions. As, as mentioned, Jefferson's the sole candidate. So maybe we won't grill him quite as hard as he uh, had he been in a whole herd of candidates, but why don't you tell us about yourself, Jefferson, and, we'll, and, and maybe why you'd like to join the council. Is this better? Okay. I think I'd start with um, uh, just who I am as a person. I grew up here in, in Newburgh, um, did all 12, 12 grades of education in Newburgh school. Um, and, you know, just growing up here, doing everything from, um, you know, Shalem, Shalem Park and Rec soccer to Cub Scouts, uh, all the way through Boy Scouts, the Old Fashion Festival. I mean, all of my formative memories really come from Newburgh. Um, it's really um, where my heart and soul is. Uh, after high school, I did join the Navy, where I served four years as a Navy corpsman, got some great exposure to leadership, and and healthcare was my first indoctrination, and um, got some nice exposure to bureaucracy. Um, and after four years of service, I uh, came back, entered the civilian world, mostly working in, in medical clinics, earned my bachelor's degree from George Fox University in 99. Uh, Shortly after that, I began working at Providence uh, Newburgh. Um, at that time, I was managing several clinics in the area of internal medicine, family medicine, there were some folks at uh, Dr. Kern's old practice. And we were really campaigning for the new hospital at that time. And so it was involved in a lot of, a lot of that activity, bringing a lot of new specialists to town. Um, it was really great to uh, kind of build something uh, that I knew was going to impact my hometown. Um, and in working with that, uh, I worked really hard to make sure the clinic was bilingual and had a lot of uh, work around um, the Latino uh, Latinx community. And I really just didn't feel like we were doing enough, especially in the Medicaid space. So I ended up leaving, doing some soul searching, ended up at a, a federally qualified health center in Portland. It's a free clinic, uh, taking care of Native Americans and um, uh, uh, urban Native Americans and uh, homeless. Uh, we had really great structures around alcohol and drug treatment, around you know social services, and it was there I really started to understand um, racial disparities and what the kind of the impact was in communities, the lack of trust um, that these marginalized communities were, were experiencing, and really had to embrace my own my own white privilege at that point. So was really uh, uh, a point in time for me that was that was pretty transformational. Um, around that time, I was also working with uh, Portland Safety Net. I was on the coalition of community health clinics, was their board chair. I had a chance to really <clears throat> work deeply with Portland Safety Net and understand a lot more of the politics involved in healthcare, the politics involved in homelessness, and what, what was happening in the community. Um, from NARA, and I guess also relevant at NARA, we had a lot of federal grants, uh, state grants um, that I would handle from uh, from the RFP all the way through through the inception. So, really got a really great understanding of how government funding works and uh, and that structure. Um, I joined Kaiser Permanente um, about ten years ago. At that point, I was in the Mid Valley Service Area. Um, led that service area for Kaiser, so was the the face of Kaiser in that community. Um, so it was a you know on, on the, uh, the the SEDCOR, the Strategic Economic Development Board. You know sat on um, uh, Insights, the Workforce Planning Board. Um, really took you know went to all the ch the chamber meetings. Really you know started to understand small town politics. 
where corporations play a role in that, you know, how we could be supportive around different initiatives and, and that type of thing. Um, also had a chance to leverage some of my experience working with homeless and working in the safety net with Kaiser, eventually moved into a role of managing all of the government programs, just Medicare and Medicaid, uh, and most of our free programs for Kaiser Northwest implemented a lot of interesting things around diversity and inclusion and how we could um, do things differently. Um, deployed lots of community health workers, culturally specific community health workers into communities and uh, worked on some co-design projects with specific communities to design uh, resources that made sense for them. Um, from there, I was able to leverage that into a national position with Kaiser uh, where I consult on social determinants of health care management strategies, um, how we work with, um, with uh, populations. And that's pretty much where, where my work is today. I uh, recently did a really large project where we built networks in all of the communities that Kaiser Permanente serves of CBOs. Um, we contracted with a third party to um, build those networks. The CBOs run those networks, They and then health systems can refer into those networks, connect people to um, social services. Uh, then another big project I'm working on has to do with really the additional risk and stratification of, of patients and connecting them with services. That, that's mostly my work today. Um, live here in Newburgh, um, obviously District 4, own another property in uh, Councilor Bacon's district uh, off Wynuski uh, as a rental property. The three children, they're grown. My youngest is 18, also product of the Newburgh school system. Uh, he's a senior this year and getting ready to, to graduate. And we have, we have two absolutely adorable dogs. Um, <laughs> and then, um, yeah, I've also served on the Project Access Board uh, for two years most recently, and then um, four years or more with uh, Familius and Action. Um, and then that's a position that I would step down from um, if uh, selected to join the board here, uh, just for time management reasons. That's a great organization. We do a lot of, uh, uh, we put on a health equity conference we have for the last 13 years or so um, that's really focused on Latino health equity. It's kind of one of the first in the world that, uh, that was really doing that. Um, and then we're actually kicking around the idea of doing uh, kind of an environmental um, impact on um, on vulnerable communities um, as the, the whole topic for, for next year. So really interested in, in the vi environmental impacts, both the structural and then um, whatever happens with, with populations and the actual um, physical structures and the impact of in environmental change. So with all of that, this seemed like a really, really great opportunity uh, for me to explore local government, making an impact in communities through local government. I realized most of the Council's work is probably more structural and administrative, and um, you know most of my projects. You know, I'm, I'm writing business cases, figuring out NPVs, you know, finding out what the the KPIs are going to be and how we're going to structure uh, and get results. And I, and I think that's where I could be a, a real benefit. Just my background there, plus working on boards for so long, um, used to re reviewing finances and having that fiscal responsibility and contract review been involved in contract negotiations and creations. And um, I just think it really aligns with, with my skill set. Uh, other questions, folks? Anyone? I just have to say that it's crazy I've never met you and our worlds are <laughs> almost identical <laughs> systems. So it's nice to meet you. <laughs> yes, uh, Counselor, we have a lot of friends in common, actually. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I have actually three separate questions I'd like okay. to. One, first one, you rated um, the city uh, transportation uh, as a C. Mm -hmm. And why is that? And how would you fix it to get it up to a B or an A? Yeah, when I looked at um, transportation, I thought, a lot about you know the transportation infrastructure and and what we have available. Um, I think I gave it a C based on on my perspective. We're we're a single car 
household. Um, and if I need to get somewhere, I think about, you know, walkability of the city. I think about, you know, what's available for public transportation. And, and really public transportation is, is, is only an option for longer distances. You know, if you're gonna be moving from, uh, from Newburgh into Sherwood or, or whatnot. Um, so I think that, you know, it's probably as good as it's gonna get in my mind at this point. Uh, but if I compared it to other cities I've lived in, San Diego, Portland, other places where walkability was amazing and public transit was easy, um, you know, even even Salem, Oregon, um, you know, and like I said, I think it's a limitation of the size of, of Newburgh. Um, but it would be interesting to look at, you know, how do we get more, uh, maybe even rideshare uh, folks participating out here. Um, it's very hard to get a rideshare out here through. Um, through Lyft or uh, through Uber, um, the waits are usually pretty long and it's pretty inconsistent. So, uh, so okay, my next see. question um, it goes along with some of the problems that we've seen in in Portland and other cities across the U.S. where people have uh, been talking about defunding the police. What would how would you handle a situation where we had a small but vocal group of people that kept coming to the council? wanting to defund the police, how would you, how would you respond or handle that? Um, I think I would look at and present as much data as we can around um, really what the, the coverage area of our police department is versus the number of officers we have and um, how they're used, what are the, um, what are the event metrics that, um, that they're experiencing and really, you know, compare those to other cities, compare those to other situations. Um, you know, I know there's been attempts to do things, um, you know, in the areas of, of mental health around de-escalation training. I know Portland police went through a lot of de-escalation training and they're still experiencing a, a lot of problems today. So it's not necessarily about uh, defunding the police force, but what kind of services could we wrap around the police force? Is there a chance that we could provide, you know, additional mental health ride-alongs with ambulances where we could turn over, you know, certain, um, certain calls to um, another service um, where we could put, give support to the officers where they need it? Um, I'm not really in favor of a, of a defunding myself, but, um, you know, I would really want to make sure that we could communicate appropriately to whatever group um, what, the, what the data is and, and what the data shows. Okay, good, because I was going to follow up with a yes or no, would you defund, want to defund the police <laughs> or not? Okay, um, last question I have is, you had mentioned in here um, on your application that um, you want to help Newburgh to continue the journey of becoming safe, diverse, inclusive community. What does that, what does that mean to you? And is it, are we not that now? Uh, I think we're close. I think it would be foolish to not recognize the, the divide that we're, we're feeling right now. Um, I'm saddened that the divide um, is often so extreme. You know, I, I come from a world where we, we live together and we disagree and you know, people have emotional intelligence and they understand that one person may want feel one way about an issue and another person may feel another way about an issue, but we don't have to, you know, totally dislike each other and we can still be friends and, and, and move together. And I, and I don't, and I feel uh, more just divisiveness than that uh, right now in this community. Um, and so I, I want to help, help to make that, that change. You know, I want to, uh, embrace um, uh, equity and inclusion, uh, make sure that our LGBTQ kids feel safe, that there's not suicide risk because they can't find the resources. You know, there, there are just so many ways in which um, I feel we've, we've confused the, some of our arguments and, and put too much of well, one group feels this way and one group feels that way when there's probably some very clear middle roads that we could come to. Um, 
And I'd really love to explore how that can happen in this community. Let's see, other questions, folks? All right. I'll just note that, you know, in the in the question of safety, and you mentioned it, we talked about, you know, the police and all, but you do rank here public safety as an A plus in Newburgh. So mm -hmm. um, I assume that you believe that it is a safe community. I do believe it's a safe community. And uh, I did some research to find out, you know, how safe it is. And right. it's a very safe community and our, our officers are doing an excellent job. Um, right. I've never, um, I've, you know, I've had some, some thefts in my neighborhood, but feel relatively safe yeah. um, and I, I do do appreciate our, our police force yeah yeah uh, plug it not too much but uh, top five regularly in the state right mm -hmm. for, for safety so yes yeah. so and we're proud of that so there you go um, anything else you'd want to add um, no I uh, saw the uh, questions online so prepared stuff for all the questions but Did I want to make sure that you you got what you needed from me and yeah it, that yeah. you heard um, where my relevant experiences are. And, and, you know, I have some flat spots. I think, um, you know, I'm really excited about um, uh, urban renewal, but I don't know a whole lot about that. Um, I know a little bit about homelessness, and, uh, but it's just been through, you know, attending conferences and, and I do make grants with Kaiser and we've made some grants around uh, using community health workers to, uh, uh, to help with, um, uh, uh, eviction prevention, um, which has been pretty successful. So, you know, interested in looking at kind of innovative ways that uh, that we could help with that. As far as the urban development goes, you know, I, I'm really interested in what that balance can be where, where uh, community members who've been here for a really long time don't feel pushed out. And yet at the same time, we can revitalize. Um, you know, I think there couldn't be a, a, a really good balance, but we have to figure out, you know, what that is. And I'd love to learn more about that. All right. Anything else? Anyone? No, Elise. Thanks. Kind of going off of what um, what um, Councilor McBride was speaking to, um, I'm really proud of our council in the past year for trying to remain as nonpartisan as possible. And can you just speak about, and I think it's really important um, as we go forward and try to really find common ground and shared values in a community that does feel super fractured right now. So can you just speak to a little bit in your professional and you're obviously very involved in a lot of different community efforts where you, how you've searched for common ground with someone that you may appear to have stark differences on a specific issue, but where you've um, found common ground and then gained respect for one another to yeah. To, yeah, understand those differences. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's the key is is trying to understand where um, each person comes from. And um, I can't be so bold as to think that 100% of what I think is right, um, nor can I be so bold as to think 100% of some what somebody else thinks is wrong. Um, and so I really want to understand what is it that's formulated the decision in their mind, what is it that's motivating um, the particular um, disagreement between us? And then I try to find whatever that common ground is. I want to I want to uh, uh, seek to understand what the position is before I can, you know, make a judgment or 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 feel a certain way um, about it. Um, and then I have to just be able to respect that person's right to disagree. I mean, one of the key reasons I joined the Navy was to, um, you know, protect what I felt was an ideal of the American way, and that was our free speech. And for people to be able to disagree openly. And, um, but at the same time, I also fought for this great American melting pot. You know, I wanted to, uh, to keep that ability to have diverse opinions and have diversity. Um, and so I think we have to be able to continue to capture the best of, of both worlds. Um, and I and I think we can get there with common ground and just seeking to understand and uh, really learning uh, from each other. Thank you. All right. Anything else, folks? Mike, I just want to say one last thing. Thank you for your service. 
I, I that means a lot to me. So thank you. I appreciate it, Councilor. All right. Well, um, hearing no other questions, um, I think we can we can let you go. But the uh, tonight we'll, we will decide tonight, um, okay. and we'll uh, later on in the business session, and then we'll be in touch immediately after, right? Yeah. Yep. In touch immediately after. So thank you're you. welcome to stay, um, or. Yeah. I will stay. I'd like to see the procedure. Oh, cool. All right. That's awesome. All, right. all righty. Well, thanks. All right. So we've got a little bit of time. Uh, city manager's report, maybe? Awesome. James, are you going to give us a report tonight, too? No. Not tonight. Not tonight. Okay. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council. We'll be covering the events for February. Next slide, please. First of all, I'd like to mention that I and Finance have been working very hard building our memorandums of understanding with ARPA recipients. James is working on some excellent text, which we're going to use for these agreements. And we're trying to figure out right now what each one will be depending on the organization so that there can be attainable goalposts set up from the beginning to make sure everything comes to a good success. Now let's look at the world of public works. Over the past six months, public works has been facing impacts caused by supply chain and inflationary issues, some difficulties with staffing, and it has caused recruitments that have affected not just the department, but of course, state and county. But we're still going ahead and hiring our positions as we can. Staff have shifted to longer range planning on maintenance and operations. And they've had to closely monitor and review increasing material and supplies costs, changing or modifying activities so as to still meet our regulatory requirements and community expectations within our budget. I'm very proud that the preliminary non-staff numbers that they provided me with have managed to keep cost expansion down to about two and a half to three percent, even though inflation has been running at a far higher rate. So we've done a bit of belt tuckling here. New slide, please. Staff has also taken on additional workloads due to those staffing shortages with some staff turnover and extended vacancies as recruitments have taken longer to fill. And I know council knows the number of times that we've had to come back to try to refill positions. With the help, guidance, and continued support of city HR staff, the department has been able to fill several of the current vacant positions, and recruitment efforts are continuing to bring us entirely back to full staff. Currently, we are four FTE short out of the 50 maximum, so that's a lot better than it has been many months ago. New slide, please. To help reduce the impact of COVID on staff and visitors, 16 blue zone air treatment units have been deployed in city buildings to include city hall, the library, public safety, wastewater and water treatment plants and the maintenance facility. The blue zone units destroy viruses, bacteria and mold up to 99.997% lethal effectiveness by circulating air through these units as long as they are running for 60 minutes before people enter the room. So that's how long it takes to go up to full effectiveness. The UV light is completely contained and therefore there's no possible exposure to any persons as long as they don't take the cases off while they're running. New slide, please. For the public at home, I've included uh, quick code for, the, for you to scan to find out more about blue zone air purification. The units will combat the possibility of airborne COVID, but also in the longer term, will reduce all kinds of airborne illnesses caused by other agents. These purchases and deployments were made possible by the American Recovery Act plan money. New slide, please. And here in a somewhat blurry image, you can see air being sucked through the machine. And over on the right hand side, you can see the curve showing how over time, the amount of living things in the air is slowly slaughtered. 
So it's extremely effective. New slide, please. Now I want to focus particularly on public works maintenance activities in this presentation. And here is a rundown on some of the maintenance activities we've done. So for example, service disconnects, 37. Water meter radios replaced, 118. Water meter maintenance, 42. And a lot of searching for buried mainline valves and other underground things that have become covered with soil. That's inspection hatches and valves. New slide, please. And I thought I would show you what I'm talking about. We've been doing locates to uncover the valve caps so that we can actually get access to things that, as we should. Now, Russ did not explain the picture on the right to me. I, I'm assuming it is not a vole or another varmint. I'm assuming that it is, in fact, an underground pipe that has become buried. New slide, please. And more. Street sweeping, during the last month, we've collected 70 cubic yards of garbage that is pulled up off of our streets. 285 feet of storm pipes video inspected. And you can see a list of other activities. And I would like to call out that the, the tree trimming in zone one has commenced. And this was one of the activities that we were not doing during the COVID era because it was harder to get the crews close together. And that started again. And we're going to rotate through each of the zones until we have all of our tree trimming well underway. New slide, please. And this is an image of a beautifully trimmed tree where all the trees are neat and tidy and not damaged either. New slide, please. Another thing that we've been doing is we've had a demonstration for the emergency water pods. I know council has been in the loop on this since the very inception. And we now have emergency water pods deployed to the community so that let's hope this never happens. If we ever had an interruption of water supply, we would have another mechanism for getting potable water. New slide, please. And here are the locations where the first group of pods will be. And we, as I say, we hope we'll never need them, but that's the location where we can access that water if we have to. New slide, please. Collection system activities have included 10,295 feet of sewer line cleaned, sewer line CCTV inspections of a similar value, 13 inspections to remove fat, oil, and grease from our grease traps, sewer manholes inspected, and the chapter's coffee shop sewer line closest to that business was repaired. New slide, please. I'd also like to mention, as a somewhat lighter note, Ed Thomas Senior Mechanics Retirement. It was a smashing event, food was good, and the company was even better. And all of the lads and lassies were there to give him a send off on his vehicle RV tour of the Western seaboard. So he is headed for the road. New slide, please. Now operational, here's an image of the solar farm panel array. Perhaps the first in a series of money saving solar projects that the city may deploy in the future. New slide, please. In the world of finance, we were very busy meeting with departments going over budgets for next year. I and Katie implemented a new process this year using the budget change request form or BCR for departments to fill out to request more or less money from certain account line items. In other words, instead of providing a spreadsheet with every line item, We've asked the departments to fill out individualized BCRs justifying a specific change with the reason why, with a space to explain how possible savings could be made elsewhere. So that means less line items to look at and also more justification for changes. The community court program started back in February for the first time in eight months. There were some hurdles and a few cancellations, 
but we have the first round of successful graduates from the program. Six participants successfully completed the program and have had their fines or fees waived and or charges dismissed. New slide, please. I have to report that this unfortunate image is attached to the outside of Katie's door at this time. And as you see, she used to smile until budget season. As part of this year's budget process, we've taken a deep dive into some training elements that we will be presenting to new budget committee members so as to help them understand the complicated pattern that is the city's funds and budget. One of these training elements is called where do the funds flow and I have one of the slides from that presentation on the next slide. New slide please. And as you can see from a 10,000 foot perspective this is how the money moves around in our city and this demonstrates the primary funds and how the, the money shifts around. The presentation then after this first slide gets into a lot more detail on each of these different funds and who trades money with whom. And I think that by covering this at the start of the budget cycle, everybody will be more on the same page this year. New slide, please. This month, the IT department performed a replacement of some old networking gear as part of a larger network redesign. We went through the vendor bid and selection process for an intranet replacement project and have a kickoff implementation that is now scheduled coming up in the next few weeks. We also started migrating infrastructure and application servers over to new hardware and decommissioning the old. And I would like to mention that this intranet is going to allow staff to break some of the data silos that are within departments so that we can share things between departments more easily and it will be attached to Microsoft Teams. So it's a storage mechanism that is part, going to be part of Teams. New slide, please. The Planning Commission received an update on the status for housing production strategy and code audit. 3J Consulting is our new identified consultant and contract negotiations are underway. The HB 206 annual report was submitted to the state and staff met with finance department on the various grants being received. Staff participated in the associate engineer interviews and the ADA team meeting and pre-application meetings were held for a cottage cluster at North Valley Friends Church, expansion of family pet clinic and a partition at 3509 North College Street. The city held its annual economic development meeting with PGE. And I hope they will buy all the power that we can make. New slide, please. Staff continues to coordinate with CPRD on the bypass trail project. De design reviews were issued for the water emergency pods that you saw earlier, Catalyst High School, and the Edwards Elementary Expansion Design Review was submitted. The appeal on the Elliott Road right of way determination is being processed. The building division continues to be busy with Crestview Crossing and King's Landing for residential permits and activities in Lafayette continue with a new subdivision on plan reviews. And I should mention, we're one person away from having our planning team back to full strength. So that should be happening soon. A single day, we hit a record for our inspector. February 22nd, it was 103 building inspections all told. That's a lot of two by fours to check. New slide, please. February saw the celebration of Black History Month at the library with displays around the library and a walking history program in the children's library with over 70 child participants throughout the month. We're delighted to announce that regular in-person programming returns to the library March 1st. So that's already happening, right? This month, 
Latino Services Librarian Bobby Hernandez joined the Newburgh Library team. Bobby is an experienced librarian who has already started cultivating community connections with plans for a bilingual story time beginning in April, and I assume in person. New slide, please. This month, library staff have worked together to finalize plans, performers, activities, and all the things that go into Summer Reading 22. We're excited to bring back a full, normal summer reading program for kids, teens, adults, and especially excited to partner again with Public Works Department for Public Works Day. And I'm hoping that the lads will be jumping up and down on bulldozers as we count our one to fives as they have in the past. In February, Circulation Volunteer Program continued to get back up to speed after the COVID closure with volunteers pulling daily items for holds and shelving, allowing library staff more time to work on collections, making sure the database is good and processing new materials as well as fixing well-loved library materials. New slide, please. And here is a sneak peek on some of the images for this year's summer reading program, Read Beyond the Beaten Path. And you know, it's a sad fact that this will be my first normal summer reading program since I arrived here in Newburgh. I've never experienced a normal one here. So we're very delighted by this. New slide, please. HR has found February to continue to be very challenging due to a hyper-competitive recruitment environment with low response rates to open vacancies, despite robust advertising. This has added extra work and overtime to many departments and employees who are not only holding on to the status quo, but moving forward with innovation and progress across many departments. We are grateful for the, for the retention perspective that we've been able to reward our essential staff with the COVID approved stimulus funds and an extra holiday this year. We must continue to provide every option for development and retention so that we can keep the dedicated employees we have since it's very, very hard to replace folks right now. New slide, please. At Public Safety, the Peer Support Program has completed the mandatory training for that program. We now have five employees that are certified and we'll be looking to add a few more to the team as the training becomes available. This is a very important component to our officer wellness program. Sergeant Simmons was promoted to captain, Corporal Eubanks was promoted to sergeant. Our purchase order for body-worn cameras has been sent to the finance department, and we hope to be getting the program up and running in the next 90 days. PD are also making progress with some lateral police hires and Officer Slack has been moved to solo status while Officer Cromwell has moved to the final stages in her field training. And with respect to wellness, it was stated that if I'm late one night, they will allow me to use the shower here. So that is very kind of them. New slide, please. Sergeant Eric Groning was recognized as the employee of the year for the police department in 21. And the police department is working with the city engineering department to look at the concept of getting red light cameras reinstalled at Springbrook and Portland Road. And council will of course be hearing a lot more about that in the future. I'm very proud to let you know that 99% of our 911 calls were answered within 15 seconds during February. New slide, please. So that's it for February, folks. As I always say, your tax dollars hard at work, and I would love to take any questions if you have some at this time. Alrighty, folks, questions? Go ahead, Elise. I was just gonna say, there's a lot of really exciting things in there this month, Will. Thanks for all your hard work. I'm particularly excited about the tiny home village at North Valley Friends. So thank you to the planning team for helping get that along. And also thank you to North Valley um, for their incredible willingness to stand that up. They've just done an incredible job with the two homes they have. And 
um, really serving a, a huge purpose in our community. So thank you. Thank you kindly. So I was, I was just wondering, Will, um, I know the council, we've talked about the timeline for looking at um, getting going to, uh, on the search for a city manager. My thought was, or my question is, is there any way that we can speed that process up just a little bit? Um, I feel that that would be a decision for council to make um, in its own right and not one for me to. Okay. I don't think I could have. I just was curious about it. I, I don't have any particular reasons for or against. I just was wondering, you know, I kind of would like to get to the point where we're just already done with that and going on, you know, so. Un understood, okay. sir. So I'd have to, I know the HR will provide any support needed to help. And I'm sure that James will too. And I, um, I don't know if you saw, but there was a, an email today uh, from Allison about the question. Yeah, this other she it is happening right now. So fact, she's asking us to provide the questions. So that just happened. So Denise, I, I want to follow on. I have two things. One, I want to follow on with what Mike said. I, I agree. If the staff can handle us moving it forward, I, I would love to do that. So that's one. It was about the staff time for me. Um, the other one is, well, I wanted to let you know that uh, one of our posts on the Nurturing Newberg site was a thank you to the library for their great service. I saw that. That was awesome. No, no surprise to me. Me and, either. And Corey happens to be here at this moment as well. So she got to hear that. So that's good. So there you go. Uh, I just have the one that uh, a little applause was on the uh, community court. I'm, I'm just thrilled to see that that's back in, in action. Um, and six graduates is pretty cool. Um, so again, that's this is you know a means to outreach and, and Jefferson, particularly since you're here. That's I don't know if you're familiar, but that's how we're trying to work with the folks that are repeat customers in community court. So so that's cool. The other thing, uh, Elise, speaking of the tiny homes, actually on uh, the 15th we'll be doing a key ceremony for a tiny home at north valley friends uh 10 in the morning so if you are available yeah yeah we're gonna oh, yes, got one of them. Uh, me. i want to come and cheer them on that would be awesome you are you're, you are invited yep indeed so that'll be at 10 o'clock on the 15th and we'll okay. we'll do i don't think i think this is one that's going to take off from there i don't think this is going to be one of the no. uh, providence ones but but nonetheless it's pretty darn no, cool. Awesome, cool nice all right anything else folks Will, seeing none, thank you, sir. Thanks thank so you much. kindly. All right, anything else, folks? Um, I think that's pretty much what we can do at the moment, um, unless you have anything else that you'd like to mention now. All right, let's bring it back then uh, promptly at seven o'clock. We'll see you then. All right, good evening, everyone. This is City Council Business Session for March 7th, 2022. Uh, we'll call the meeting to order. Uh, there is an, in Spanish, an agenda in Spanish on our website. And a roll call, please, Zyra. Councillor McBride. Here. District Board is vacant. Councillor Yarnell Holloman. Here. Councillor Martinez McCarthy is absent for the uh, night. Mayor Rogers. Present. Councillor Bacon. Here. Councillor Finley. Here. All right. All righty. Well, thank you very much. The Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Uh, thank you. All right, the first item of business council appointments, item 4A, the appointment of a district four candidate to Newburgh City Council. I will entertain a motion, please, folks. Hello? How's about a motion, someone? All right, Mike. I move that we uh, appoint 
Jeffrey Jefferson. Jefferson, I'm sorry. Mildenberger, Mildenberger uh, for uh, to fill the seat for District 4. Second. Okay, and a second by Denise. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All right, Jefferson, welcome to the City Council and thank you very much for your willingness to serve. All right. All right, next on to Council Appointments 4B. This is Budget Committee Appointments. Uh, we have two names before you that I hope you might uh, make a motion for, for Theodore Ebora and Steph St. Cyr to join the Budget Committee immediately. So a motion would be great. Thanks, Denise. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> um, Mayor, I'd like to consent to your appointments to the Budget Committee as listed below for the term beginning March 8th, 2022 to December 2024. Second. Okay. Second by uh, Elise. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Aye. Hearing none. Thank you very much to Mr. Ibora and to Steph St. Cyr. And we will see you at a budget committee soonest, budget committee meeting soonest, yes. All right, city managers, oh, presentations, Women's History Month proclamation. All right, whereas Women's History Month is a celebration of women's con contribution to history, culture, and society, it has been observed annually in the month of March in the United States since 1987. And whereas the National Women's History Alliance designates a yearly theme, the theme for this year is women providing healing, from providing healing, promoting hope. And whereas according to the National Women's History Alliance, this theme is both a tribute to the ceaseless work of caregivers and frontline workers during this ongoing pandemic, it is also a recognition of the thousands of ways that women of all cultures have provided both healing and hope throughout history. And whereas despite these contributions, the role of women in history has been consistently overlooked and undervalued in the literature, teachings, and study of American history. And whereas the month of March offers an important opportunity to recognize the often overlooked accomplishments women have made past and present. And now therefore, I, Rick Rogers, do hereby proclaim March 2022 as Women's History Month. All righty, well, thank you. Thank you all for that. All right, I understand Zyra that we have no public comments this evening, is that correct? That is correct. All righty, thank you. And then uh, for whoever was not in or did not hear the earlier part of the meeting during the work session, we did have the city manager's report there. It is filled with fascinating details and you can find it online. All right, next on to item eight. This is the consent calendar. We have two items. Can I, do we have a motion? Mr. Mayor, I will move that we approve the consent calendar. Okay. And, I'll second that. Okay, Denise with a second. Thank you very much. All right, all in favor of the consent cal calendar signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Hearing none, the consent calendar passes. Um, and hopefully this means that Alan McKeel will become our GIS engineering technician soonest. So there we go. All right, uh, next let's uh, move on to uh, public hearings. Oh, and the other thing is also congratulations to the ARPA recipients on this last round that are listed on the website. Again, we all know you're going to do fantastic work, so thank you. All right, now on to a public hearing. And for this, we fortunately have legal counsel in the room because this is one we do not do all the time. All right, this is a quasi-judicial non-land use public hearing. All righty, so I will now open the public hearing and the purpose is Order 2022-041, an order amending the public safety fee beginning July 1st, 2022. All right, abstention, bias, ex parte conducts, and objections to jurisdiction, anyone? Hearing none. All right, the legal announcement, please, James. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The matter coming before the council is an order to amend order number 2009-0021 which would result in adjustments to the city of Newburgh's public safety fee. Pursuant to section 3.30.040 of the Newburgh Municipal Code, this hearing will be quasi-judicial 
meaning that the council will consider all evidence presented in this hearing and render a decision in the same way a court would return a verdict. The applicable substantive criteria for the decision are found in Newburgh Municipal Code, section 3.30.040, subsection C, titled Adjustment of the Existing Public Safety Fee. Testimony, argument, and evidence should be addressed and directed toward the criteria. The rules of evidence do not apply in this matter. All evidence of a type commonly relied upon by reasonably prudent persons and conduct of their serious affairs is admissible. Mr. Mayor, this concludes the city attorney announcement. Thank you so much. All right, the staff report, please, Katie. Good evening, council. So I have a just short presentation on the public safety fee update. Um, next slide. So I just wanted to give everybody a brief history on the public safety fee. So the public safety fee was established in 2009 to fund three police officers. And when the rates were passed in 2009, there was no escalation clause included. So factors such as cost of living and inflation were not factored in. So they've essentially been the same rate since they were passed in 2009. And this has caused the public safety fee fund, which is fund 16 to us, um, no longer is able to fund three police officers and hasn't for quite some time now. Currently it staffs two of our brand new officers, which are the lowest in cost. And when the city first established the fund, it built it up for several years before they started paying any personnel out of it just to get some reserves. And currently all of the reserves will be used up this year as well. Next slide, please. So these are the current rates that have been in effect since 2009. So as you can see for the 5 8 meter, that's majority of the customers there, it's $3 every month. And so that generates around 345,000. We kind of assume there's a 2% uncollectability on the utility bills. So really it brings in around 338,000. Um, next slide. And so these are the CPI rates for each of the years if we had indexed it based on the CPI. So you can see some rates, some years were higher than others, but for the most part, it's around a 2% if we averaged it. So next slide. Um, if we, so we used a 2% yearly and then indexed it as if we had increased it 2% each year, which brought it up about a 32% increase to the existing fee which brings the rate up 96 cents a month for most customers. So it'll be $3.96 now, which will generate around $456,000 with a slight uncollectability fee. Next slide. So with our anticipated new generation of revenue plus, you know, less the uncollectability. And then you can see on there, the payroll costs of the three of our least expensive officers which Newburgh is very fortunate to have very experienced officers, but unfortunately that comes with a high payroll cost. But we do have two brand new officers who are very low on the payroll scale. So that kind of keeps that cost down. And so with these new proposed rates, we'll have a, you know, a small $3,000 fund balance in there to kind of add as a buffer in case somebody goes up a step or whatnot. Next slide. And that's it for I'll be taking questions if anybody has any. All right, questions, anyone? Go ahead, Mike. So a couple of them. Um, is I don't mind seeing the, the change on the five eighths size meter, but the change from the one inch meter up to the eight inch meter, there's some pretty good jumps. Yes. And when and when we're looking at this hitting primarily businesses who have already gone through a tough couple year season. Is there anywhere that we can we can have an increase but not have it be as big of an increase? What overall is 32%? Yeah. So could we not look at a 10 or 15% increase and try and get some money someplace else or tighten the belt someplace else. I mean, it just seems like it's sad to me that that we have allowed this and I'm not trying to shoot the the messenger here, but will if you can 
if there's any other departments or things like this that that has not had attention to, this should have never gone on this long without having some type of an increase a little bit. So I don't want to see some other departments or projects coming along that we might be facing the same thing. This is the only one that is, is it? like okay. this. Well, I, I'm, I'm for this. Uh, I just, from the one inch up to the eight inch meters, I just would like to see us not have such a big increase on those businesses at this at this point. Uh, Stephanie. Yeah, I'm just curious about um, what the difference is between addressing it right now and having it part of budget committee and rolled into the budget committee discussion and decisions. So um, the fee will be effective July 1. So I think the reason we did it now was because it had to be in order. And so it was something that we needed to do separate because originally it was put in for this year's budget, but then this, this procedure of the order had to be taken care of. And then that got lost in the transition of personnel until now. <laughs> so that's why we were trying to be proactive now to get it, to get the order going and then budget for it so that we know for sure that we can fund three police officers in fund 16. So I guess I have a follow-up. Yeah. Does that mean that it was already budgeted for if it if we had already made this decision and it just hadn't gone through the process? I believe that is what the consultant Rob Moody had did. So I was under the assumption that we had budgeted for, it was not this large of an increase because we need to factor in for a cost of living increase for next year. But he had factored in, I think it was around 20% of an increase. And that, that is currently in the budget right now. We just never had did the order that needed to follow it. Okay. I guess I'd be interested in seeing what exactly it was that the decision that was made before and what the difference is between the decision that was made and what were being presented tonight. Uh, Elise. Ironically, I was going to ask something similar. I, I thought we already did this in last year's budget season. I remember this conversation and bringing it like, being brought forward and all of us saying like, we got to take care of this now. So um, I guess I would just want to see the difference of what was already approved versus what you're, what you're requesting. What they're I saying, think, yeah. what oh, they're sorry. saying is that it was approved, but we should have done this. We should, we needed an order. Yes, that's exactly correct. We just- so Was this I the amount we approved? That's what I wanna know. Is no, this, this includes an escalation clause. So we know what the, what the bargaining has completed now. So we know what their cost of living increase is going to be. And we know which exact officers we're going to fund. So we know how much of a dollar amount we kind of need to be hitting for fund 16, so that's kind of what we went off of. And so going off of an average of 2%, if we had escalated at 2% since 2010 each year, we would, we would be right at that metric of funding three officers. So that was kind of where we came to that conclusion. Um, so make sure I understand, this is the fee that appears on the municipal services bill, right? Correct. Okay, so the procedural question I guess is, so why is CRRC not looking at this? Why are they not making this proposal? That, you know, I don't know because they have asked that same question and it's always just been told that it was a separate fee that they don't address. Yeah, I would, well, my suggestion would be to look into that because, you know, again, we know that, that people look at their quote unquote water bills and they just see the increase and they're not going to see what it's for. Um, and I think CRRC should probably have a crack at it. Not necessarily this year because they're almost done, right? Right. But maybe in the future, if that's something, you know, we want to do, because that's on a two-year cycle too, isn't it? So yes. that Okay. And so that way you don't have to do it all the time. But anyway, so that's just a suggestion. Okay. Anything else? Any questions at this point? Other questions, folks? Okay. All right. I will now open the public testimony portion of this meeting. It's open. Do we have any public testimony? No, we do not have any public testimony. Public testimony is now closed. All right, any, any agency letters or comments? 
No, we do not have any. Okay, thank you very much. Then close public testimony. Now, final comments. Oh, city attorney's legal office. Ah. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, post announcements. If the decision is not made tonight and continued to another date, the record can be reopened at that later date by motion of the council. If postponed to a later date, do not assume that no additional evidence will be taken. If the decision is made tonight, the council has the authority to reconsider the decision following proper procedure under Newburgh Municipal Code. The fact that the council could reconsider their decision may not affect the length of time for appeal of that decision. An appeal of this decision would be to the Yamhill County Circuit Court by petition for writ of review. The jurisdictional time limit for filing a petition for writ of review is 60 days from the date of the decision. That concludes the post announcements. All righty, well, thank you. Final comment, uh, Katie, and your recommendations. Um, I would recommend you approve the order as presented. Okay, thank you. All right, folks, uh, any further discussion and deliberation on this? Uh, you know, I think I will echo what both Elise and Stephanie said that I'd like to see what it is we approved. Um, so I would, I would, and I'd also like to know what it would take to kick this in the future to citizens rate review. Uh, and so I would suggest postponing until then, but that's my suggestion. So sorry. Um, I don't know. Um, what do you all think? Yeah, Mike, go ahead. I, I agree. I, I, because I don't remember it from last year. I'd kind of like to see that again. And and I'd like to also see some numbers of what would it be if we increased the one inch to the eight inch, 10, 12%. I don't want to go over 15. That's just my opinion. I don't know how the rest of the council feels, but that's, yeah. Uh, Denise. I just, I wanted clarification on what you were asking for, Rick. Sorry, so I was, and, and I'll, I'll echo what Mike said too. So I, I'd like to see what we originally approved, uh, then the change to this, and then I'd like to see actually what Mike said about uh, reducing the impact, particularly on the business, and what that would look like if we took it to fifteen percent instead of thirty-two, or whatever. So, oh, and then oh, and the final one was to see what it might take to to have CRRC review this in the future. Uh, Elise. It, I mean, I will, we're all, I'm obviously going to uh, vote for it once we get those answers. This is something that was already, I think, passed by the budget committee. So I feel like we, it needs to go through and we need to get it through in, in a timely way for Katie to be able to implement it by July. I also hope that um, once those questions are answered, but I also wonder if this could be an opportunity for our communications folks to have something ready so that when it does pass that we can have some you know social media and maybe some sort of literature explaining the increase i would like to see us every time we have an increase do a communication push about around what it is yeah i agree the actually the rate review just came out in the water bills right the that that that, 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 that that's coming up so yeah yeah um Anything else, folks? Um, yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, at least that's true. We don't want to delay this. Uh, is that will that work if we wait till then come back next meeting? Like, yeah, that would be okay. I think we were just trying to stay ahead of the the budget game so that we're not jamming everything up till June. <laughs> uh, what do you think, folks? Does that does that work for you? For that, we'll review it the next meeting. Yeah, I see nods. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. All right, so what do you procedurally need now? Anything? Uh, no, Mr. Mayor, we just, now that we're oh, continuing. Oh. Can I just, I'm sorry. Sure. sure. I guess now I'm like sitting here talking out loud. Like if, if we have the intent of approving, I'm not quite sure if it's going to, if it's going to cause, I, I, I guess I want like a straight answer from Katie. Is it going to cause concern to push it to next meeting from your operational perspective? Because now it, it was approved by budget. It just is a a correct number that was wrong in the budget approval. But yeah, my understanding was that it was put into this year's budget, and we're in order to fund what we have for the two officers, we're using up all of the reserves that we had built up as the fund balance. So that's why it's going to kind of zero out, and we need to kind of address it for next year's budget. 
But if you guys would like to see something, I can certainly put it together for next council meeting. What was proposed? Uh, uh, Denise. Never mind. Okay. Well, you know, the other thing is if somebody would like to make a motion different, if you'd like to make a motion and see if that'll carry, that's the other way to do it. So up to you all. Okay. I've, I do have a question. Fire away. Can we, um, could we pass this tonight and still get all that other information back next week and see how we can, um, change how we do it in the future or does it all need to be one thing? I think in the RCA I wrote, I included an escalation clause starting uh, 2023 so that we would match the CPI index so that this doesn't happen in the future. So if we wanted to address that with rate review or anything like that, I would have to amend the order that I submitted. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Why don't we why don't we start with a motion? If anybody feels that you can approve it now, why don't we start with that? See if we can get a vote on that. And if not, we'll have to vote to table. All right. I'll make a motion. Um, I hopefully I do this correctly. <clears throat> I make a motion that we um, approve order twenty twenty two. Dash zero four one in order amending the public safety fee beginning on July first, twenty twenty two, and adding an escalation clause equivalent to the year the current year West Region CPI dash U. And do we have a second? Second. Okay, Denise, second. All right. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, signify. Uh, let's take a voice vote. Actually, um, Zyra, if we could. Councillor McBride? No. District board is vacant. Councillor Yonel Holloman? Yes. Martinez Nacarta is absent. Mayor Rogers? No. Councillor Bacon? Yes. Councillor Finley? No. The motion to not fail. All right, can we follow then with a motion to table then if we're uh, to, until the, go ahead, Mike. Sure. I, move that we, I move that we table this. Um, uh, oh, now I lost the place here. Uh, the, order. Uh, the, the, the order for this uh, review on the water meters. Do, do we have we, a second? Can, can we specify the, uh, Mr. Mayor, if I may, sure. can we specify the date to which we're tabling, which oh, if we're sure. talking about the next meeting? Yeah, would, to, to the next meeting. March 21st. March, yes, March 21st. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Need a voice vote for that. You good? No. Okay. All right. It is tabled until March 21st. Uh, sorry for the added work, Katie, but uh, thanks. Thank you so much. All right, let's move on to new business. All right, library update. All right. Good evening, Corey. Mr. Mayor and counselors, thank you for having me here tonight. I am excited to talk a little bit about the library. Um, this is going to be very brief, so... Um, I'm happy to answer any questions at the end, or um, you can always send me emails too if you have further questions. Uh, next, please. So today, for this brief um, update on the library, we're gonna talk about connectivity, findability, and community. So just focusing a bit on three different areas. Next, please. So one of the biggest things to happen at the library in the last few months is that we now have a permanent network connection between City Hall and the library. And you might have thought we had one already, um, but in fact, we had two basically antennas pointed at each other from the roof of City Hall and the roof of the library. 
And um, that didn't work so well when it was very rainy or when it was windy or when a tree grew a little bit too tall. So that meant that public works and IT were on top of buildings very often, getting them realigned. <laughs> Uh, not so much fun for anyone because, of course, it was usually nasty weather when it happened. Uh, so this was started um, with the work of Will when he was still at the library with public works, with IT. So um, eventually, after a lot of work by a lot of people and something that has been needed to happen for a very long time, there is now an underground pipe between the library and City Hall with the cables running underneath to permanently connect City Hall and the library. So we are extremely grateful for that, especially with some of the storms that we've had lately. And then the next two things I wanted to show are both apps that are available to people coming into the Newburgh Public Library. So the one in red that says borrow items, that is actually an app that people can get on their smartphones and they scan the barcode and they're able to check out the books themselves on their phone, which is amazing. We love this. As well as we still have, of course, our self checks in the library and people can always go to the circulation desk for help checking out items as well. And then uh, the one on the far right is a Schmeckada, um, Schmeckada community, Schmeckada, not community, cooperative, regional library service app. And um, this one I use from home very often. I can place my items on hold so that they come from either the Newburgh Public Library for me or from other libraries. I can renew my books that are overdue. Um, and I can also use this to check out the eBooks and e-audiobooks as well. So it's just another way that we're connecting our people to our services and making everything as easy as we possibly can. Next, please. All right, findability. This is one that is very exciting to us at the library um, because our job is to get the right material to the right person. So something that staff have worked very hard on this past year, led by Amanda Lamb and Children's Services, is our picture book themes. And this was inspired by Will as well because he's done picture book themes as at several of his previous libraries. Um, so he was a great help to us for this as well. And this meant um, these books were recataloged. Uh, we had so many staff working on this project. So what we did was we came up with a list of, I believe, 32 themes. And instead of having all of the picture books alphabetical by the author's last name, we put them first into themes and then the author's last name. So what we were finding is we had kids who were wanting books on transportation or books on dinosaurs, or one of my favorite categories is sparkly. So, so instead of looking all over the picture books for this, now the families can go specifically to these categories and then find it really easily within those categories. Um, so families have been very excited about this and uh, it's much easier for our volunteers and staff to shelf as well. Every year we update book lists as well. Uh, people love coming into the library to pick up book lists and we have book lists, lists for many, probably 15 or so different categories is pretty typical for something that we have. Another project that's taken place in teen in the last few months is we now have Christian fiction spine labels. Again, findability is important to us. So uh, we did already have Christian fiction spine labels in children's. And as you probably know, in adult services, we have an entire Christian fiction section. So this was just uh, findability for this area that we weren't seeing it before. We've done website updates to make things more clear for people to find. And then our great courses are physical items that can be checked out. They're DVDs on a wide variety of subjects. Those have been extremely popular. So we now have um, lists, paper lists. People are really liking the paper lists as well to find those. And then um, our library of things list is always getting updated as we're continually adding. So our library of things includes things like ukuleles and telescopes 
and all kinds of board games that have been very popular as well. Um, cake pans. There's just a really wide variety of items that people check out from the library now. And those things are extremely popular as well. Uh, next, please. You do uh, things like tools too? Do you do lending tools? Um, so we, we have done a few tools. Um, I will say um, right now they are tending to be to get stolen. So I'm not sure we'll be replacing the tools. They are rather expensive yeah. and we have not had great luck with those coming back. Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a story behind that because um, somebody saw it go in somebody's backpack. Oh. So that person did end up checking it out, but it hasn't come back. So um, anyway, so we'll see. Maybe in the future we'll be able to add more. So as far as community goes, I talked, uh, or Will's presentation talked a little bit about our senior librarian, Bobby Hernandez. So we're extremely happy to have her with us now. She's just been great. Uh, we also are continuing our child care connection book deliveries. So this is a program where we deliver a box of books to 15 child cares throughout Newburgh once a month using volunteers for um, doing the book deliveries. That program has been going on, I think I started it maybe 20 years ago. So it's been going for a while, still going strong. Thanks to our volunteers too for delivery. That's an important part. We also, we love Head Start. We love them so much. So uh, we have continued our Head Start book deliveries to the classrooms, but we're getting ready to start story times and Head Start classes again. I will be very excited when we can start our um, Head Start nights at the library. We usually have an evening when the library is closed where we've used grant funds to provide a meal and talk about library service and do a story time and have crafts. And it's just been, it's one of my favorite events that we do. Loads of Hope, we've also continued outreach with that program too. So Loads of Hope, as you might know, is a community program um, I believe it's through Love Inc. And um, it's where people can go to a laundromat to do laundry one night a month. So uh, we support them by sending books and also um, steam kits for kids as well. So activity kits that go to the, to the um, site as well. And this month, actually I think Wednesday, we start again with our story times going out to that group as well. Our teen librarian is getting started with high school turnaround books. Those are books that have been donated to the library or books that have been discarded but are still in okay condition. Um, they get a second life going out to the community in a variety of ways and the high school is just one of the ways those go out. And then the Senior Center Monthly Book Club is starting again in April for the first time since COVID. So. We're very excited to get that going again. And we've just been in contact with Friends View about some additional programs, um, some of which we might do at Friends View and um, some of which Friends View people will get bussed out to the library. So we are just so excited to be getting uh, programs back in the library and to be going out again to places to do programming as well. So, and that is all I have for you today. Thank you. Uh, questions, folks? Go ahead, Mike. So is, do you get a lot of books um, donated to the library? We do get yeah. a lot of books donated. So when books are donated to the library, a few different things can happen with them. Um, one, of course, we take a look at the books to decide if they can be added to the library. So right now, for instance, I have a whole stack on my cart that I'll use for replacements for books that are just in really poor condition. So I'll add those, I'll replace it with those books instead. Um, some of the books, especially the ones for children that are not in good enough condition for me to add to the collection, but are still in okay shape. Then we add that to our turnaround program and that goes different places in our community, like goes to fish. Uh, when WIC is seeing people in their office, it goes to WIC as well, Virginia Garcia Medical Center. Um, we were doing doctor's offices, but before COVID, so we haven't started that one again. So they, those go many different places in the community. 
And then the other thing that can happen with them too is our library friends might sell them either online or in the lobby sale. And then the money from those sales go back into the library as a grant for uh, programs or different things like that as well. Other questions, folks? All right, not, see, not seeing any, I don't think. Corey, thank you, right? Thank you so thank much you. for what you, all that you do. And thank you also for uh, your willingness to step into the current position and all too, while we, while we figure out where we're going. So, so thank you very much. And thank you to everyone at the, at the library. Thank <laughs> you. All right, uh, let's move on to council business item 11A. Ah, council compensation. Is this you, Katie? You're back, all right. Uh, we, we're, oh, and Sue's coming up too. Uh oh, we got uh -oh. now. Now, now we're in trouble. Hi there. How are you? Uh, uh, doing well, thank you. <laughs> so I read a lot. I read a lot of council stuff, and I read a lot of city history. And I've been sifting through a 1,650 square foot building for seven and a half years. So one of the things that you're also out of date on is your council compensation. I have been asked about this in 2014 when I came, 2016, 2018, 2020. Yeah, so it's 2022. And um, I'm just gonna go over the history with you and then Katie's going to talk about the finances. What we're trying here is not to make you into moguls. You're not going to get rich off this opportunity. Um, it's to try and become more efficient and move kind of out of a 1980s model. I went to high school in the 80s. Nothing wrong with the 80s, except some of the hairdos and the, the, <laughs> the outfits. So I can say that having graduated in 1982. Uh, be here again in two weeks. Okay, so your current method for council compensation was established by Ordinance 2008-2704, and it just updated one where it increased you from $8 a meeting to 10. It was not a real barn burner of a change. So it sets the rate at $10 per meeting to be paid on a biannual basis. This is found in the Newburg Municipal Code, Chapter 2.05.010, and then council rules augments that um, code by defining the types of meetings that the council can be compensated for. So let me tell you, following this procedure is darn time consuming and labor intensive. Um, the city recorder prepares a timesheet, okay? Touch once. I used to work in factories and they used to have people come and evaluate how many times you touched things in a factory to uh, improve your efficiency. So you touch once, then I send it out to the counselor. They have to review it, approve it, remember their meetings, several emails back and forth, and then it goes to payroll. I will now let Katie talk about the payroll process to process a little chat. I mean, you guys have heard how outdated our systems are here. So we still have paper timesheets. We have to make sure you guys have signed it and we have two signatures on it. Then we have to hand enter it into our payroll system. I have to review it all. And we have to issue manual checks, which are stamped manually by will. It's just a very tedious process. And, you know, we would love to make things more efficient, you know, with our finance side. And, you know, we already have the mayor on a stipend and nothing gives me more pleasure than looking at that and saying, yep, same as last month, let's move on. <laughs> So in addition, uh, finance has to follow additional accounting rules. So it's gotten more complicated to pay you that 10 bucks per meeting. In 2018, the Internal Revenue Service decided that we would tax counselors for individual meals at meetings. So then they have to deduct that and or tax you for it. And then there are now changes um, with the Public Employees Retirement System in 2021. We now have to pay into the retirement system on the council's compensation more hand entry. See my fingers moving here? Type, 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 type. Um, so the average council compensation check, so I took all six of the counselors and added up their compensation from July through December and then divided it by six. I can do that much math. 
the more complicated things I get to Katie. Um, so your average check was $156. So that's a lot of work to do such a little check. So we are asking tonight for some feedback to change the method and yes, possibly the amount um, to have a set monthly stipend to be established during the city's budget process. This would do a couple things that would make it automated. So we would not be doing all of this, you know, yes, there's few of you and there's lots of employees and we're still doing some of those, but we're trying to catch efficiencies where we can. Um, the other thing is you kind of out of date. 2008 was, yeah, over, over a long time ago, over 10 years ago. So staff looked at this and Katie and I collaborated. And, um, if you want to blame someone, blame me. Cause I'm like, Hey, I've been wanting to change this 2016, 2018, 2020. Hey, it's 2022. Um, set a uniform rate to be paid as a stipend monthly. Um, and suggested rates are an average of a council compensation for the previous six month period, $156, or other such equitable amount. You know, we had the highest for the last six month period, 270, or the lowest, 150, or we could run you an average over a longer period of time for the remainder of this fiscal year, so through the end of June. And then in 2022, 2023 fiscal year, increase the amount to $200 per month per counselor. That can be either done all at once with the adoption of the budget in June or in a phased approach. See scenario below. So, um, oh, Katie actually had that part highlighted. Sorry, I'm just oh, gabbing no. on here. Keep going. I'm going on. <laughs> okay, so um, we set out two scenarios. One was a uniform rate of monthly stipend have those currently in office be paid an average of council compensation for the prior six months or year or two year period, whatever average you want to use. Then when their terms are finished or if the seat is vacated midterm to have the new rate take effect. So that's scenario one. It's a phased approach. And James can speak to the ethical part of voting to enrich yourself. You're not going to buy a country on this. Um, but that has been a hang up before when it was brought up. Scenario two is a complete approach to not have the council set the amount. It does not have to be set by you. It actually says in the charter to let it be set during the annual budget process. So you don't need to have an ordinance that says how much you get paid. You can do it during the budgeting process, but you need to be mindful that the budget is a moving train and we don't want Katie to have five grumpy cat pictures on her door. <laughs> Just one, you know, oh, back, Katie. Uh, so in order for this to take effect in time for next year's budget, we would need to come back with an actionable item by April to revise that ordinance that establishes the rate in the municipal code. And the fiscal impact, to be honest, if you were to go to paying yourselves $200 per month and the mayor would continue with this $300, um, it could be potentially up to $15,000 next budget cycle. So changing the method won't impact the budget, but changing the amount could result in an increase. Um, even if you weren't to change the amount, if we just changed the method, that would save a lot of work. Then there's two pages of a lovely compensation survey that the city of Banks actually did. This question comes up for other cities um, back in December. So that's the most recent numbers I have. And then I'll let... Katie weigh in now that I've totally dominated the presentation. No, it's great. Um, I think my only suggestion would be to go to scenario two where the budget committee sets the rates just because that would move everybody to the same cycle instead of having to remember to change certain counselors rates in 2025. That's just my personal opinion, just for ease of. So the item before you is not for action tonight. We thought we'd bring it to you. You could say, we don't care. Go back and now we want you to write hand calligraphy on the checks. And we'll go back and do that <laughs> if you so wish. Uh, but I certainly hope you don't. Uh, and it's up for your discussion. It It is as you wish, as you will. All right. Comments or discussion, folks? Anyone? Elise? I like option two as well. And I also like just in concept, it going to budget committee 
for setting the compensation rate. I will just make a comment that I do think that <clears throat> having some higher compensation, not obviously like someone's going to have a career off this, but it, it would compensate for individuals that may not have the luxury to be um, on a board like this. Um, I think about, you know, daycare, work, getting off work hours. Um, I just think it, it would be a way to create some equity within community members. Other comments, folks? Uh, go ahead, Mike. I, um, so the option two is $200 a month, which is quite a bit more than what we're getting now. Correct, but it is in line with, with whatever other municipalities. Um, yeah. The council has essentially not changed their compensation except for that $2 per meeting increase in 2008 in decades. So. I mean, I guess if we were sitting differently financially, we're not, I'm not saying that we're in bad dire straits. I'm not saying that at all, but um, I don't know. I would like to do something to make it easier for you guys. I, I, I definitely want to do that. Um, because I've thought about that with, when I see you send this stuff out, but so, and I'm not exactly sure what that looks like at this point, but I don't, I don't want to give us more money than what we're doing right now. I mean, it's the scotch in me, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I can, I can wade into this because it doesn't impact me. So there you go. But I think certainly the idea of some way to make it easier on you all so that you don't have to do the timesheets and the whole thing. So some kind of standard amount, I would like to leave it to the budget committee to determine what that amount would be, because that way you all don't have to. I also very much appreciate what Elise said, because you know there are people for whom that 200 bucks might might make the difference as to whether they serve on council or not. So I I, I agree all with all the above. So anyway, okay. Any other comments, folks? All right. Cool. Well, the other thing you can waive it, right? If you can't, you waive your compensation. Oh, the joy of council rules, 32 pages. <laughs> I think I have it memorized to wake up in my sleep muttering. The cat goes, Ram. <laughs> I go, never mind, page 28. Um, Beautifully gets up and flips the page. The cat is too. Nice. The cat thinks it's fun. I recently adopted a shelter pet to walk across my pillow, meaning my head, at two and three and four in the morning to say, get up and play with me. Okay, um, enough about Sue's personal life. Um, so yes, per your council rules, you can waive the amount. There are people who have done that in the past. You, for example, Mr. Mayor, do waive your month, your your hourly. And let's talk about the dichotomy of why the mayor gets a stipend and and can collect per meeting. Because Elvern Hall, who was your mayor for many, many, many years, Mike probably knew him. Did it, is Elvern still alive? Last I, okay, I think he passed on. But from like the 1970s to the 1997, I mean, he was in office a long, long time. So there was a six month period where you, he was the acting city manager. Does that sound familiar? And um, I read and read and read and read and read and looked for this and because we were trying to find out the source of it one year and he got, he agreed to accept $300 a month in lieu of, you know, as a salary to be the city manager, but they never changed it. So the mayor could always collect per meeting as well as waive. You have always waived. And yes, other counselors can waive their compensation. So what, what was his name? To whom we Elvern. Think? Hall. Over, over Hall. E L V E R N. I have over to thank. So yeah, yeah, he was here for a long time, and that's he was cool. at one point like president of the League of Oregon Cities, and he was a very active guy. So, all right. Any other uh, comments or direction for staff, folks? All right. Not hearing any. Anything else then for the good of the order? Any other council items? Mr. Mayor, yes. I believe I mentioned an email to you, Ms. Saylor emailed about your questions homework 
that you oh, were to yes. remind the council Correct. of? I certainly and will. And moving yes. the process along for the yes. city manager recruitment. So um, while we're speaking, Allison Seiler was listening to the meeting and she heard about the idea of speeding up the process. Um, I believe if I got this correct, she said, if you counselors get her your two questions by the end of the week, she should be able to move it up. So she has uh, given it back to us. So two questions from each to Allison Seiler pronto. Um, Stephanie. I did not receive that email. So if someone could send that to me, that would be great. All right, we'll get it sent out. Anyone else? Anything else? All right. Remember still, uh, Mayor's Prayer Breakfast, if you haven't uh, told me whether you're going to be there or not, I think it's April 2nd from 8.30 to 10. Um, you are certainly welcome. And I'm buying lunch or breakfast. So there you go. So um, anyway, so let me know on that one. And uh, anything else? Anybody? All right. I think we're done. And it's 7.53. Good night, folks. Have a good evening.